Gentlemen, he's at the NBC Studios in Burbank. And he's later with Craig Kinnear. Thank you. Oh! Thank you, welcome. No, no, really, welcome to the big show like a confused animal rights activist trying to free the world's chia pets. This is a little later. Welcome to the big program. Folks, my name's Greg Kinnear, and if you must know, yes, it's true, I was Lisa Marie's maid of honor. Are you happy? Do you want to make something of it? All right, then, let's get started. Uh, we have a couple of media bites for you here at the top of the show. These are bits and pieces of the news that you just may have missed. Senator Bob Dole is not at the top of the list of senators who would like to see a health care bill passed while Mr. Clinton is in office. Yesterday, he took to the Senate floor to say exactly and precisely why he's not in favor of the latest plan proposed by George Mitchell. Take a look at this. America has the best health care delivery system in the world. America has the best health care delivery system in the world. America has the best health care delivery system in the world. What the hell's wrong with the TV? Uh, Bob, let me tell you something. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that if the audience doesn't laugh at the joke the first time, there's no point in repeating it over and over and over again. Uh, Dr. David Pugh is a llama researcher at Auburn University in Alabama. I know it sounds Woo! like the... Wake up! <laughs> I know it sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, but, uh, but it's true. They study the animals. You'll like this story, sir. They study the animals, the llamas, to see how they react to heat, among other things. Here, Dr. Pugh tells us why llamas are becoming popular pets. Dr. David Pugh and Dr. Jim Wenzel lead the llama research team. Twelve years ago, there were about 2,000 llamas in the U.S. Today, there are more than 55,000. Most people use them for, for uh, pet animals because they're so neat. They come up and hum and love on you, you know. Oh, yeah, we know. You know, the great thing about llamas is after they're done loving you, you can eat them. <laughs> hey, hey, come to think of it. Did you bring your llama? <laughs> Senator Ted Kennedy is supporting President Clinton in his efforts to get a health care plan passed. He spoke in Washington yesterday about why, exactly why, we need it right now. Teddy? Others are giving up their insur insurance, gambling they won't get sick. Older Americans on fixed budgets are struggling with the cost of medication. Too many have to choose between buying food and filling prescriptions. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you have to choose between buying food and prescription drugs, you might want to try something that's worked very nice for me over the years. Pill sandwiches. <laughs> just, mm. You see, that would be the idea of combining food with the prescription drug. <laughs> Finally tonight, <laughs> millionaire Daniel Kalugar. Is it Kalugar, John? Millionaire Dan just moved to New York City. He's looking for a wife to share the good life with him. The 40-year-old investor took out an ad in New York Magazine searching for a spouse, and here he is now telling us what he's looking for in his ideal dream date. The 40-year-old multimillionaire has some very specific characteristics in mind. He's someone that's beautiful, that's physically attractive. She's intelligent. Um, she's outgoing. She's gregarious. Um, she's fun to be with. Richard Simmons! There you go! And look at him up there, accepting all the applause. Such a big man. If they only knew what an evil little, little man he is. John, what the hell is this pack of gum doing in here? I told you to keep the pockets empty. Uh, uh, oh. How many times have I told you not to use your starch? Gives me a rash. Sorry, Greg. Sorry who? Sorry, Mr. Kinnear. Wasn't that the bear? People, people, people! You call yourself writers? Not writers. Better stuff than this in the New England Journal of Medicine. My nephew's kindergarten class turns out better material than this. Crying out loud. Oh, Josh. 
<laughs> yeah? What was that line you wrote about Janet Reno? A joke? Oh, a joke! <laughs> of course, a joke! I think a joke, though, if I'm not completely mistaken, is supposed to be funny. That's not funny! This is funny! <laughs> Esposito, get me out of here, now! You know, for a little guy, Johnny, I've got a big appetite. What do we got here? Ah, oh, the usual disgusting selections. Next. Oh, boy, doesn't that look delicious. If I were a pig, give me some coffee. Mmm, hot black coffee. It's... Do you like it? Best damn cup of coffee I've ever had in my whole life. Makes me wonder, like, you know, why am I such a jerk? Why is it, John, get me this, John, get me that, all day long? You're, you're just a human being. You're just one man. Tell me, John, really, why do you think I'm like the way that I am? Well, Greg, maybe it's a uh, height insecurity. Height insecurity. Hmm, height insecurity. Yeah, it could be something to do with my, my height, I suppose. Or maybe it's the fact that there's no sugar in my coffee, you jerk! I'm waiting! <laughs> hey, Esposito, get me out of here. We got a uh, quick break to do for you. We'll be right back with Richard Benjamin after these words. My guest tonight is a uh, veteran motion picture actor and director. He starred in such movies as Goodbye Columbus and Catch-22. He won a Golden Globe for his work in The Sunshine Boys. He directed such films as My Favorite Year, Mermaids, and Made in America. His latest is Milk Money. And all I can say is I hope he brought enough to cover the postage on his later letter. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Benjamin. <laughs> So they tell me, uh, I don't know if it's true, but they tell me that you were at one point wearing your uh, blue blazer and, yes. and walking the hallowed halls of NBC as an NBC page. Uh, I was a page and a guide at NBC in New York. Mm -hmm. How long were you, uh, did, you did you hold this uh, occupation? <laughs> <laughs> I, I held it for about a year uh -huh. until I uh, figured out that I'd been lying to them for quite a while. Yeah, that kills any yeah. job right off the bat. <laughs> The great thing about the job is that you were able to call up anybody and, you know, tell them that... Uh, the, the idea is you didn't make any money at all, mm -hmm. or very little money. Uh, you made no money. Um, <laughs> let's, let's not kid ourselves, but the perks were that you got... You were inside NBC, uh -huh. and from then on, you, your career was made because you could be at a desk like this, and I was out in the hall or something, and pick up the phone and call anybody. Uh -huh. uh, and you could, you, they figured you'd then be, you'd get a fabulous job. So I went down the list, and at that time, uh, Chet Huntley and David Brinkley were doing the news. So I decided that um, I would like to do the news too. Actually, that night. <laughs> <laughs> so, Goodness, lofty goals yeah. for a young Richard Benjamin. <laughs> no, I was in there. This was the perk of the job. Right, I right. was inside. So I actually called Chet Huntley, you know, and no secretary, and he comes on the phone. He said, yes. I said, uh, Mr. Huntley, this is Richard Benjamin. I'm page here, but I'm really interested in news. And he said, really, why don't you come right in and see me? I said, I'm on tonight. <laughs> I, I can feel it. Chet and I on the phone now. I, we've hit it off. That's it. Yes. You're in. Brinkley, Brinkley's probably out of here. <laughs> So I go and sit with him, and I said, I'm very interested in journalism, which was a complete lie. And the only, the only reason I said that was because I was in his office. And I said that, uh, he said, really? And he said, well, and I'd sure like, you know, to be involved in network news and stuff. And he said, well, and I'd like your advice. And I thought he would say, you know, there's just something about you, 
you know. And uh, let's see, what time is it? We got a half hour until air time. And, you know, can you get out of that blazer and get, you know? And he said, you know, what's best is to start at a real small newspaper Ooh. in a small, so mm. this curtain came down in front of my eyes, mm. you know, he was actually giving me the right advice, you know, but I had the idea that I wasn't going to be doing the news that night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So back I went to my my, my little desk, yeah. <laughs> ready to call somebody else. Now, Brokaw doesn't even return my call, so you can imagine. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, actors have uh, turned directors. I think of uh, Clint Eastwood and, and Rob Reiner. The uh, list goes on and on. How has, uh, you were an actor for 20 years, how has that helped you in terms of uh, your directing now? I'm getting jobs now. There you go. <laughs> and you don't have to lie anymore. <laughs> I don't have to lie. Acting is hard because <laughs> all you do is wait, do you know? And you have to pretend that you're not waiting um, and that you don't really need a job, but actors are auditioning all the time. It doesn't matter where they are, if they're getting gas somewhere, they're auditioning. Uh, <laughs> now, how, how would that work? Uh, <laughs> 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 you, you'd, you'd go up and give them your card and say, uh, Supreme, please. <laughs> Four. <laughs> it's a figure. Maybe this guy knows somebody something. But you are. You. You. It. It never stops. And that. And you. I mean, I was looking for work mostly in New York, and you'd walk around in the streets there, trudging along with your eight by tens and your, you know, resume and stuff. And you'd go into these places, and you'd knock on the. You know, they, the thing about New York is they told you there was never anything for you. There wasn't going to be anything for you, and you really should get out of this business. And the, the, the thing about being an actor is when you go and audition and they say to you, thank you, but, you know, they're, they're, no thank you, they're not saying we don't like your screenplay. They're mm. not saying we don't like your book or your painting. We're saying, that they're saying we don't like you. Uh, <laughs> and as a matter of fact, we don't like your personality uh, or your face. One might almost take that personally. Yes. <laughs> And the other thing that you figure out as you're back in the street is that I, I don't think there's any of that that I can actually change. <laughs> that, that's it. So they just said, we don't want you. You know, Woody Allen uh, has in his act, he says he has a dream that the letters N-O are chasing him, you know, and, and that's what it's like. Yeah. But uh, as far as uh, directing, obviously, uh, it's uh, not the same same situation. No. You make the calls, you make the moves, I would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it actually is very, it's, it's what I wanted to do in the first place, and it's very satisfying, and I'm having a wonderful time. You made your uh, uh, directorial debut on a classic uh, uh, film, uh, My Favorite Year, from 1982. How mm -hmm. did you get that job? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Michael Gustav and Mel Brooks, who produced the picture, sent me the script, and I loved it. And it was about your show of shows and everything and stuff that I knew. And actually, all that stuff had been done at NBC. But why did they send it to you if you hadn't directed at that point? Well, because here's how this works. Uh, the, the five or ten guys that they wanted were not available. That, the, <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's say the 40 guys that they wanted weren't available. So there's, 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 there's a couple of ways this can happen in Hollywood. So they can either go to that other group that they know were no good, or they can get somebody who's completely unknown in directing and think maybe he's a genius. Because you haven't done anything, who knows? He may be a complete that's, fool. That's how I got this job. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always the possibility that Orson Welles is out there somewhere. You know, the minute you do something, that goes out the window. Right, forget it. So they sent it to me, and anyway, I liked it and wanted to do it, and we met and everything. We, we hit it off, and they actually <laughs> gave me this job. And... I, st I was ready to do the picture, and David Beagleman, who, who was the president of MGM at that time, just before I started to shoot, came to Mel Brooks and said, now, can, remind me again, why are we allowing him to do this? And Mel said, we think he's sane. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a uh, vote of confidence, if I've ever heard one. If you haven't seen it, here's a quick clip right now. Peter O'Toole received Best Actor nomination for this. Take a look. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mr. Swan, you're white. You mean it all goes into the camera lens and then just spills out into people's houses? Yeah. I said nobody had the goodness to explain this to me before. It's nothing to worry about, Mr. Swan. Our audiences are great. Audience? What audience? Audience. You knew there was an audience. What did you think those seats were for? I haven't performed in front of an audience for 28 years. 
<laughs> Audience? <laughs> I played a butler. I had one line! I forgot it. But don't worry. This is going to be easy. For you, maybe. Not for me. I'm not an actor. I'm a movie star. Uh, we're going to do a quick break and be right back with Richard Benson after that. Is it in? If it's a girl? I know. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> to her, to her. Dad, this is V. V, this is Dad. Hello. <laughs> Coming August 31st for a theater near you. That's a look at uh, Milk Money, your latest film. What's this about? Milk Money is about a bunch of kids who uh, feel that they're way behind in the battle of the sexes. They're 12 years old. And they figure if they could just see one naked lady, mm -hmm. they'd know everything there is to know. More of a documentary, if you think uh, about yes. it. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> And uh, one thing leads to another, and uh, Melanie becomes that lady. Uh, and they pool all their money, their milk money, to see her, and then their lives change forever. They figure they're men after that. Sure. Mm. Some of them were, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and Melanie's life changes. It's a romantic comedy, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, is it tough to work with uh, kids? How, how old are the, the, uh, the, the youngins in this the one? The youngins are 11 and 12. Uh-huh. Uh, no, they're, I mean, they're fabulous kids, these kids, they're great kids, but what you, what you realize is that they have no, they have two speeds, which are on and off. You know, if Michael Patrick Carter plays the main kid, you know, has a big scene that day, I say to him, you know, Michael, later you've got a big scene coming up with Melanie, you'll have to rest. So, he says, what, what, what do you mean, like sit down, you know, <laughs> take a nap, I don't, I'm not tired, I don't, uh, uh, and the rest of them is to play basketball, uh -huh. uh, and then later on, and it gets to be, you know, a couple, nine hours later, and you see the switch go, and, there, you know, he goes to sleep, and you say, Michael, we're ready, but he's, he's gone, so, uh -huh. He's out. He's out. We also found out that they, somebody said that they were hungry after every, every scene. Do you know they needed energy? So they became like seals. Thank you. <laughs> that was great, Michael. Here, come on. Come on. I'd love to hear that. Let's assume they're asleep at 2 o'clock in the morning, though. Uh, Ed Harris is also in this picture, and he's, he's a great actor, he an actor I, I've always felt uh, is, is somewhat underrated. Uh, do you think this is the kind of movie that was, uh, he was in his element? I, I believe so, because I've always felt that he's a sexy American leading man, and I wanted someone strong to play opposite Melanie because she's very, you know, hot and strong and funny in this movie. So I wanted somebody who wasn't a pushover, you know. And Ed uh, displays in this a real flair for romantic comedy, and I think he's just wonderful. Yeah, it is. A, it is a comedy. I saw it last night. There, there is a, uh, a scene where these uh, young boys, uh, 11, 12 years old, go to pay and see a naked prostitute. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, are you worried about catching any, uh, do, do you worry about catching flack for those types of things? Because it is the type of thing where uh, people might take somewhat of, <clears throat> they may have a problem with it. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I mean, it, when you see this movie, anybody who sees this movie will see that it's completely, you know, safe. I mean, it's a romantic comedy, and it's really about how Melanie and the kids change it, and in fact, it's it's not so much what she does, it's, it's who she is. So I think if anybody only hears that and doesn't pay attention to what the actual picture is, they may, they may be, but once they see the movie, once anyone tells them what they've seen, they, they won't object to anything. But it, she is that in the movie so that she can make this big change right. and have a real life. She didn't get to have a life. Yeah, she's great in the movie. We'll do a quick break here and be right back with Richard Benjamin. later why is it late my guest tomorrow night is marie osmond hope you will uh tune in for that show uh
Uh, we have a later letter for you here from uh, Howie Mandel, who was uh -huh. on last night. By the way, did you know that he auditioned for a role that Mark yeah, Lynn Baker got on My Favorite Year? Yes, he came in. Uh, we had this, this purse that was shaped like a hand. Oh. Yeah. Well, no wonder he didn't get the role. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, that's an old rule, never wear a purse to an audition. No, no. no. Uh, or heels, or... Right. This will be a... Uh, no, heels are okay. Yeah, heels are all right. Yeah. Uh, With this a will... simple black... Uh... Dress. Yeah, yeah, and Anne Klein or something yeah. like that. Uh, uh, Dear Richard, where is Waldo? Love you, Howie Mandel. Uh -huh. So that'll be a quick one. I think those cartoons are starting to rub off on Howie. I see. <laughs> but you do have to answer it. What? How? How am I going to answer that? What do you mean, where is Waldo? What does I, it mean? I don't know. We'll talk about that. Uh -huh. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Maybe we'll still be trying to figure it out. Richard, thanks. Thank you, Bye-bye.